In the last video we talked about sobel edge detection. Okay, so the sobel operator is a kernel convolution process we can use and it returns a high response where there's a sharp change in gradient of the image and a low response where there isn't. It's generally run on grayscale images that we first blur just to make sure everything's nice and smooth. It also handily produces an orientation at every point in our image which tells us from north in the image upwards to downwards, left and right, what direction is our edge facing. Uh, and that can be really useful for sort of post-processing this image. So that's what we're going to talk about now. Um, the canny edge detector uh, is essentially takes a Sobel operator and, and, and makes it just a step better or a step more useful perhaps for image analysis, which is to get rid of the edges that we're not really interested in and keep only the really good stuff. The canny edge detector was published in 1986 and um, the input of a canny operator is simply the output of Sobel. Okay, so we've taken our image, we've converted it to grayscale, we've run our Gaussian blur, um, and then we've run our Sobel operator in both the X and Y directions. We've calculated the gradient and the orientation of those, and that's when we're ready for, for Canny's process. Okay? It's fairly simple, but of course, um, it's also effective, and so it still sees a lot of use. There are other uh, newer edge detectors, and there are certainly a lot of newer filters that, have, um, that are used instead of Sobel, uh, but Sobel still sees a lot of use. Canny works by taking the image from uh, the Sobel output, thinning all of the edges so they're one pixel wide, Okay, because thick edges doesn't really help us. What we really care about is where are the edges, not how thick are they. Imagine we're trying to find the center line of a root, okay, because we want to find where the root is. If we do a Sobel edge detection, it's going to find gradients at both the left and the right side of the root, and it's going to be a bit messy. But also, it's not resolution independent. If we've got um, a really high resolution image, the gradient's going to be spread over many pixels. Um, in a low resolution image, you're going to have a very sharpish gradient because that's the best that we can do with those, with those pixels. Um, what the canny edge detector does is get rid of all that and just say, this is where your edge is because I've got rid of all the stuff on the outside of it. Canny works by first filling the edges and then we use a process called hysteresis thresholding, which sees use in other, other areas, which is essentially a two level threshold, which I'll talk about. Okay, so um, the first thing to do for every pixel is try and find out if it's a local maximum. Okay, that means that it is bigger than its neighbours. Okay, sounds easy, but we also bear in mind the orientation that was produced by Sobel. So for every part of the image, if this is our image, and we're examining, let's say, this pixel here, okay, we've run our Sobel X and Y operators on it, and we've got a value of GX and GY, and we've got a value of the magnitude of this edge. Now, the magnitude of this edge might be smaller or larger, and what we want to do is try and find out if X is bigger than its neighbours. We really only care about whether X is bigger than its neighbours um, across the edge, right? If along the edge, yes, it might be getting brighter or smaller, but that's not really what we're concerned with. So basically, if the edge is travelling down in this direction, then we really care if X is bigger than this one and this one, okay? If the edge is travelling in this direction, then we really care if X is bigger than this one and this one, right? So what Canny does is say, what's the orientation of our edge based on the output of a Sobel operator? Remember, we can use inverse tan to find that. And then given that, is it bigger than its neighbours? And doing that over the whole image will produce lots of very nice thin edges right at the peaks of the centre of our, of our response. So if you've got um, a, a gradient on your root or on your whatever, on yeah. the edge of the flower, the petal or whatever, it's basically just going to find the strongest yeah. bit of it. So if we imagine looking at the gradient from the side, then you might find a Sobo response looks a bit like that, okay? Because it's a kind of shallow edge. You know, it's brightest where the edge is most steep, but because it's a photograph or something, maybe it's not completely steep, okay? And what Canny does is scrap all this and just get an edge right in the center, okay? And that's really what we want, okay? So that's the first process. The second stage is to remove the edges that, even though they're a local maximum, they're still not very useful to us because maybe they're really weak response. So noise, basically, right? We want to create an image with the dominant edges only, and preserve only the dominant edges. For that, we use a process called hysteresis thresholding. So let's imagine that we've run our non-maximal suppression over the whole image, okay? So we have lots of nice individual lines of pixels, okay? That's great, but um, how do we threshold them to decide what edge is important and what edge isn't? So if we pick just a threshold, let's say all the edges go from naught to 255. So naught is no edge, 255 is about the strongest edge you can imagine, okay? Um, what value do we pick that's a good edge? Right? If we pick a value of 20, most of the edges are going to be in, right? which means you're going to get a lot of noise, a lot of nonsense. And if you're looking for the football in a picture, there's going to be a lot of other stuff you have to weed out before you can work out where the ball is. But then if we pick a high threshold, like 200, we're going to get the edge of the ball, maybe, 
Um, but we might start to lose some of it because not all of the edges are going to be as strong, just sort of just how it is, right? So let's show you history of thresholding in one dimension first, and then you'll see how it applies to an image. So if this is our one dimensional image, okay, and we have an edge response over here that's pretty good, and we have an edge response over here which is really good, and then no edge response over here. Now, if we were thresholding just by a single level, if we put this level here, then we're going to get this top area, but we're not going to get this area or this area. And that might be okay, but we might want this one. Okay, because this is kind of part of the same object, perhaps, that we want to try and preserve. So hysteresis thresholding will have a threshold here and a threshold here. Anything above the top threshold is automatically okay. So we take all this, and this is already okay. Anything below the bottom threshold is automatically discounted. It's not a strong enough response. That's probably not an edge we're interested in. Okay, so we take off here, and, and this is all got rid of. And then anything between the two thresholds is only preserved if it's connected to something above the top threshold. Okay, so we're trying to sort of continue along edges where we've already had a high response at some point. Okay, so maybe the side of your football is really good and the other side is not so good, but because it's connected, you think, yeah, it's probably okay. Part of the same object. So this stuff gets included simply by being connected to this high threshold. In two dimensions, it works the same way. We look around the image and we search for edges. And any edge that's above our top threshold, we automatically include. And any edge that's connected to it via pixel traversing, we automatically include everything else we scrap. And that really preserves only the sort of the core edges of the image, the stuff that really shows you what shape everything is. And then you could maybe do some other post-processing to find objects or something with that. So I should probably show you some images now. I've grabbed my laptop again. I haven't coded up Canny because there's a lot of good implementations of Canny out there. It takes a little bit of time to, to traverse an image. Okay. If you're looking for an implementation, the OpenCV one is very good. Okay, and you can use OpenCV in Java and C++ and Python, as far as I know. Okay, so um, what Canny does is it takes our Sobel operator and using the orientation of each edge, it thins it, and then it does history to thresholding to find the sort of dominant edges. And you get a picture that looks much like what it did before, but now we've really just got the outline of the flower. Almost the entire edge of the flower and its leaf have been preserved, but we've lost a lot of stuff between the petals. So we can obviously adjust both the lower and upper thresholds of the hysteresis thresholding and the, um, the sort of noisiness of a Sobel operator by blurring. And both of those will have an effect and we can really control what edges come out of Canny. We can have just a few really dominant edges or quite a lot of edges if that's what we want. Here is an edge, fairly obviously, we can see that, but the computer can't. So if we put our Sobel operator here, then what we're essentially doing is doing 100 times 1 plus 100 times 2 plus 100 times 